אנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית בארץ ישראל. היא מדינת ישראל. In this uh, last lecture, I'll venture to say something about Israel's Declaration of Independence in Israeli law since 1948. Now, if everything had gone according to plan, this subject wouldn't exist today. Uh, Israel's Declaration of Independence in its operative section promised a, quote, constitution which shall be adopted by the elected constituent assembly not later than the 1st of October, 1948. Uh, in the hours before the Declaration, in the People's Council, various parties objected to formulas in the Declaration. In an earlier lecture, I quoted Ben-Gurion's reassurance, and I'll bring it again. We're declaring independence, nothing more. This isn't a constitution. As for the constitution, we will have a session on Sunday when we will deal with it." End of quote. Well, it didn't happen that Sunday, and it didn't happen before October 1st, and it hasn't happened to this day. Israel has no constitution. Eliakim Rubinstein, a former Supreme Court justice, wondered whether Ben-Goyon hadn't made a mistake by not pushing through a constitution along with the Declaration of Independence. Looking back, he wrote, a wistful murmur suddenly sneaks into the heart. Perhaps a moment of truth was lost on that Sabbath evening at a rare moment of relative unity in the face of external dangers when a constitution could have been hammered out. Perhaps, and I quote him, a debate over the constitution would have derailed the passage of the Declaration. Perhaps, perhaps not. But the speculation also assumes that Ben-Gurion had an interest in a constitution at that time. He didn't. He was running a war, then building a nation, and didn't want anything that would distract from either. So he dismissed a constitution which would require debate as an unwanted diversion. And this was his view in mid-1949, and I quote him. Debate about a constitution will take years, keeping all of Israel and all of the diaspora busy. If a word appears about freedom of conscience, the argument will erupt about this freedom of conscience as opposed to freedom of religion or as a part of the freedom of religion in the entire Jewish world. Instead of concern for what needs to be done, Jews can argue about the Constitution. This is liable to hurt us a great deal." End of quote. Perhaps Ben-Gurion had in mind the debate that preceded the Declaration of Independence, especially the back and forth over the mention of God, Tzur Yisrael. Did Israel need more of that? Ben-Gurion obviously thought not. More generally, he seemed to think that there was no real need for constitutional law, that the law would simply be what the legislature determined it to be at any given moment. This comes through in an exchange he had with Felix Rosenblatt in the People's Administration over the issue of borders. You remember that exchange. And remember, too, that Rosenblatt was arguing that according to international law, a state had to define its borders. Here's the back and forth. Rosenblatt, this is an issue of international borders. It is impossible to ignore. Ben-Gurion, everything is possible. <laughs> if we decide now not to say borders, then we won't say it. Nothing is a priori. Rosenblatt, this is not a case of a priori. This is a legal matter. Ben-Gurion, law is a manner that human beings decide. Everything is possible. Law is a matter that human beings decide. Nothing is a priori. Obviously, this wasn't a leader who was going to invest in constitution writing. And so no constitution was written. I'm going to simplify things here, and legal experts will note my elisions. But to put it in a few sentences, the Knesset, which was supposed to function as the constituent assembly for drafting the Constitution, tried and failed to make progress. Instead, it resolved to put together a Constitution 
in a piecemeal fashion. The Knesset would, as necessary, pass certain basic laws. These would stack up over time, and eventually they would be codified into a constitution. The first one wasn't passed until 1958, 10 years after statehood. It's the law regulating the Knesset itself. Later there would be laws on state lands, the presidency, the prime ministership and ministers, the military, the judiciary, and so on. By the way, the law of return from 1950 isn't a basic law. It was passed eight years before the Knesset organized itself to pass the first basic law. Now, these basic laws still weren't a constitution, and as the Knesset website points out, and I quote, regarding the question of the superiority of the basic laws over other laws, there are differences of opinion. Now, I won't go into the debates over this issue, but suffice it to say that it would be a mistake to think that these basic laws presently function like the U.S. Constitution. So what about the status of the Declaration of Independence in all of this? It was also nebulous. Now, I'm not a legal scholar, and you should be forewarned that you aren't in safe hands when it comes to the history of the Declaration in Israeli law. I imagine from the reading that I've done that another seven-part lecture series could be delivered by a legal authority on precisely this subject. But I'm going to have a historian's crack at it, and I beg the forgiveness of experts for any errors. The issue of the Declaration's legal status came up fairly soon. In December 1948, a case came to the Supreme Court concerning the government's requisitioning of an apartment, privately owned under an inherited provision of British mandatory law. The owner of the apartment claimed that the state had violated his property rights in light of this passage in the Declaration of Independence. And I quote, the state of Israel shall be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. The court rejected the argument, and I quote the decision. The only object of the Declaration was to affirm the fact of the foundation and establishment of the state for the purpose of its recognition by international law. It gives expression to the vision of the people and its faith, but it contains no element of constitutional law which determines the validity of various ordinances and laws or their repeal." End of quote. In other words, the Declaration had an intended purpose, that Hasbara and diplomatic purpose cited by Ben-Gurion, it couldn't be misapplied as constitutional law and certainly couldn't serve as a basis for judicial review. But the idea that the Declaration also embodied the vision of the people and its faith created a small opening. The intended purpose of the Declaration may have been time-limited, but the Declaration still managed to capture the core values of Israel. These had been approved by a unanimous vote, and so they had some indeterminate value going forward. In 1953, the Supreme Court took up a case involving the government's attempt, attempt to shut down a newspaper. Again, such censorship was completely legal under the colonial era regulations of the British Mandate, which had been inherited. But could these laws also be applied by the government of Israel? The court decided not and accepted, at least in part, the argument that the Declaration of Independence did matter. Yes, the Declaration still couldn't be the basis of judicial review, but, and I quote the decision, the matters set forth in the Declaration of Independence, especially as regards the basing of the state on the foundations of freedom, and the securing of freedom of conscience mean that Israel is a freedom-loving state. Insofar as the Declaration expresses the vision of the people and its faith, we are bound to pay attention to the matters set forth in it when we come to interpret and give meaning to the laws of the state. For it is a well-known axiom that the law of a people must be studied in the light of its national way of life." End of quote. So, when it came to interpreting law, the Declaration warranted attention as an expression 
of the national consensus. The Declaration was gaining stature, the enduring vessel of the vision of the people and its faith. But while the Declaration might be invoked to nix inherited dictatorial British legislation, which preceded the state, what about laws enacted by the Knesset itself? After all, Knesset laws are passed by the elected representatives of all the citizens of the state. Here, the Declaration's standing was much weaker. The situation through the 1980s was succinctly described by Zev Sigal, a legal expert, a journalist, and a professor in an article from 1988. And I quote him, Along with its great power, the Declaration of Independence is limited in terms of its legal application. The principles of the Declaration, which recognize the fundamental freedoms of the individual, cannot stand up to explicit, unequivocal Knesset legislation. The Knesset may legislate as it wishes, and if its laws entail discrimination, then this is legislated discrimination, which takes precedence over all that appears in the Declaration of Independence." End of quote. So his conclusion was that Israel still needed a formal, written constitution whose explicit directive will establish its supremacy over regular legislation such that any law that contradicts it will be invalid. Sagan must have realized that this wasn't in the cards in 1988. So what happened as the 1980s drew to an end? When the Soviet bloc broke up and the Soviet Union came down, the formerly communist states, now transformed into new or restored democracies, embarked on a slew of constitution writing projects. All of them had provisions for the guarantee and maintenance of basic rights. And suddenly, Israel seemed legally impoverished by comparison. It had no constitution, not even a basic law constituting a Bill of Rights. Such protections as existed were embedded in regular legislation that could be overturned at any time. It all looked far too improvised for what had become one of the world's older continuous democracies. This would be the background to Israel's so-called constitutional revolution, led by Supreme Court Justice Aharon Barak. And the Declaration of Independence had a central role in it. Now I can sum it up in this way. In the continuing absence of a constitution, the Declaration of Independence was pressed into service as a virtual constitution, particularly as regards its third and fourth sections, which refer to individual rights and freedoms. And the chief method of achieving this was to pass two basic laws guaranteeing rights, each of which provided that it be interpreted in accord with the Declaration. The first of these was the Basic Law of 1992 on Human Dignity and Liberty, which first defined Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. As amended in 1994, the law reads as follows, and I quote, Fundamental human rights in Israel are founded upon recognition of the value of the human being, the sanctity of human life, and the principle that all persons are free. These rights shall be upheld in the spirit of the principles set forth in the Declaration of the Establishment of the State of Israel. The same first paragraph appears in the 1994 Basic Law on Freedom of Occupation, where there too Israel is defined as a Jewish and democratic state. Now, Justice Barak described this as a total transformation in the status of the Declaration. Not only did the Declaration now have legal validity, but respecting the basic rights in the Declaration was what he called a constitutional obligation. So much so that, as he put it, regular law cannot contradict it. The rights in it weren't just legal rights that appear in other laws, but constitutional rights. Justice Dov Levine was of the opinion that the two basic laws, and I quote him, brought about a dramatic change in the status of the Declaration of Independence, so that it is no longer just a source of interpretation, but an independent source of human rights. It gives the citizen in Israel a bill of rights on a supra-legal constitutional level. In parallel, there emerged 
the false impression that the Declaration itself established Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. That's not so. As we've seen, the word democratic not only didn't appear in the Declaration, it was deleted by Shertok. It's only since the basic law on human dignity and liberty from 1992 that Israel has been defined by law as a Jewish and democratic state. So while Israel is indeed Jewish and democratic by law, that definition doesn't rest on the Declaration, but on legislation of the Knesset. Now, the expansion of judicial review by Israel's Supreme Court, grounded in these two basic laws, has been hugely controversial in Israel. The rise of judicial activism, the notion that everything is now judgeable, has been at the core of a struggle between a left liberal court and right conservative governments. This deserves its own treatment, another series of seven lectures. Uh, my point here is that there's nothing in the Declaration itself that fosters such judicial activism. It was never the intent of the founders that their Declaration be used as a basis for judicial review. Indeed, the Declaration disavowed its own character its own characterization as a constitution by mandating a totally different procedure to produce one. It was pushed to the constitutional level in the absence of anything else. Now the two basic laws that I've just mentioned deal with individual, individual rights and freedoms. They may be said to institutionalize and amplify the promises made in parts three and four of the Declaration. But what about the collective rights in parts one and two, and specifically the collective rights of the Jewish people to a Jewish state. If parts three and four needed to be institutionalized and amplified in basic laws, what about parts one and two? Justice Barak argued that they're already covered. The Declaration of Independence, he claimed, can't be invoked selectively, and parts one and two enable parts three and four. The state is Jewish and democratic, but the Jewish character is fundamental. Were the Knesset, he says, by some strange fluke to pass legislation making Israel a bi-national state, it would be unconstitutional. So there's no need for any legislation to anchor Israel as a Jewish state. It's already anchored. But not everyone agrees. There is a view that there should be a basic law for this as well especially should the day come that all of the basic laws are combined in a constitution. This prompted the proposed basic law entitled Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, which was first submitted in 2011. The rationale for the law has been explained by the Yelet Shaked, and I quote her. In our laws, there are universal values, rights, already enshrined in a very serious way but the national and Jewish values are not enshrined. Over the past 20 years, there has been more of a focus on rulings over universal values and less over the Jewish character of the state. This tool, the nation state bill, is a tool we want to give the court for the future. Now, once again, this is a very large topic and much ink has been spilt and pixels lit in the discussion of it. And I can't do it justice here. It's become part of the left-right political warfare in Israel. In Israel, the left insists that Israel reconstitute itself as a state of all its citizens. The right counters that Israel must be the nation state of the Jewish people. And the center already figures Israel is a Jewish state, so why the brouhaha? Uh, after all, what everyday Israelis know about the foundation of their state comes from remembered fragments of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration affirms the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their fate, like all other nations in their own sovereign state. So what's not clear about that? There are arguments for and against the proposed law and what should and shouldn't be in it. Uh, in fact, its present version is so pared down that it's questionable whether its passage would have any effect at all. But let me only make one point. There's a correlation between the need for such a law and any dwindling of the Jewish majority. In the previous lecture, I pointed out that it's the Jewish majority that makes Israeli democracy possible. 
It's because of the solid Jewish majority, now in the neighborhood of 80%, that all Israelis can and do have equal rights. Were that majority to be pared down by any process foreseen or unforeseen, then the demand for legal assertions of the state's Jewishness would grow. And it was Zev Jabotinsky who put his finger on this problem, and I quote him, I do not believe that the constitution of any state ought to include special paragraphs explicitly guaranteeing its national character. Rather, I believe that it would be better for the constitution if there were fewer of those kinds of paragraphs. The best and most natural way for the national character of the state to be guaranteed is by the fact of it having a certain majority. If Israel's certain Jewish majority is ever threatened in any way, then Jewish and democratic, which today are mutually dependent, would indeed become contradictory, and the pressure for legislating Jewish preeminence would grow. Now, we're far from that today, uh, but we shouldn't take the Jewish state, even as outlined in the Declaration, for granted. Ten years ago, on Israel's 60th birthday, a Knesset member called for the ceremonial ratification of the Declaration of Independence by the Knesset. Some 30 Arab and ultra-Orthodox members of the Knesset opposed the idea. Oyl Reichman, a jurist founder of a college and a law school, was stunned, and I quote him, it is not possible to imagine any American politician turning his or her back on the United States' Declaration of Independence. For me, it was a bad omen. It was a stand against the Zionist message against the very framework of our society, end of quote. A bad omen, perhaps, but perhaps it shouldn't have been a surprise. In an earlier lecture, I quoted an ultra-Orthodox signatory of the Declaration as saying that he signed out of pikuach nefesh to create the image of solidarity in the face of invading enemies in the midst of an emergency. Absent that, he wouldn't have signed it. So why should his successor vote for it today? And as for the Arabs, there's no surprise either. The Jews are the we in the Declaration who appeal to the Arabs and promise them equality. But the Declaration doesn't mince words about the reason for the state and its Jewish purpose. So why would they sign on? Yet if the Declaration remains controversial, for the vast majority, it still retains its power. Not everyone thought it would at first hearing. Let me tell another story here, this one about Moshe Gurari. Gurari was head of the Jewish Agency office in Tel Aviv. He worked very closely with Moshe Shertok on Shertok's draft of the Declaration. Uh, Shertok's te was, text was longish, it had many literary turns of phrase. Some of them are so elevated that everyday speakers of Hebrew wouldn't have understood them. And as we've seen, Ben Gurion took this text, cut it back the night before the Declaration, and then presented it as a fait accompli the next day to the People's Council. Gurari was in the museum during the reading, during the proclamation by Ben Gurion, and he described his reaction, and I quote him. When Ben Gurion began to read the Declaration, my heart sank. Things that weren't in our version, such gray prose. Eretz Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here their spiritual, religious, and political identity was shaped, and so on. With restrained pathos, without any dramatic gestures rising to the occasion, Ben Gurion spilled out the Declaration on the establishment of the state, from which he mercilessly extracted every gem Shertok had embedded in it with such love and obscured every shining phrase within." End of quote. After the ceremony, Guari asked Shertok just what had happened to the text. And Shertok, and this is Guari saying, whispered to me, half in jest and half in anger, putting space between each word, he killed us in cold blood. Yet Guari also admitted that on rereading Many years later, Ben-Gurion had given the document a powerful simplicity. Those were his words. What did Ben-Gurion ben grasp that Shertok didn't? That the moment called for powerful simplicity. Indeed, that the ethos of Israel, like the Yeshuv, would be one of plain spoken directness. And so not only did the Declaration live on as a legal document, as we've seen, it also entered the consciousness 
of modern Israel because of its succinct precision. People remember its most potent passages, even if only in disconnected fragments. Especially the opening that Gurari found so plodding. Right? Eretz Yisrael was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Ben-Gurion had added that at the last minute. In retrospect, it was an inspired stroke of genius. Yet the words themselves did not make the state. Allow me to conclude this lecture by returning to May 14, 1948, as recounted in Ben-Gurion's diary entry for that day. And here's what we find. The Jewish surrender at Kfar Etzion to the Arab Legion has led to a massacre of its defenders. At Latrun, there has been a forced retreat after, and I quote him, our people were badly hit by artillery fire. The Alexandroni Brigade has captured the Arab part of Kfar Saba. There are talks with the Irgun about its participation in a planned assault on Ramla. An isolated settlement in the Arava Valley is in danger. A discussion with Yitzhak Sadeh, the Palmach commander, on strategy. Another commander insists that the public be told of the urgent need for entrenchments and barricades. Ben-Gurion writes, I drafted a public notice on this in the name of the general staff. The call-up of more troops is decided upon. There's a problem of providing sufficient armor for the Negev Brigade. At the end of all this, a simple, laconic notation. 1 p.m. at the People's Council, we approve the text of the Declaration. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we declared independence. The nation was jubilant, and I mourn in the midst of the rejoicing. Our fate is in the hands of the defense forces. Independence had been declared, but it had still to be won. Then going years later was asked about what immediately followed the declaration. And this is his answer. I didn't attribute much value to declarations. Not that they didn't have great value, but at the time I didn't make much of them or attribute to them any value. Immediately afterwards, they danced in the streets of Tel Aviv. I didn't dance. I went to headquarters. We made preparations. During the night, we received the news that an Egyptian column had invaded, a Syrian column, an Iraqi column, and then nothing else interested me. It's at this point that the declaration receded into the background, and the war came back into the foreground. And one can understand the historians who've seen 1948 as Ben-Gurion did, as a war for independence, which the declaration was meant to support. It did the job. Israel gained swift recognition from the United States and the Soviet Union. Arms began to flow from abroad. The new state used its new coercive powers to requisition war material and draft soldiers, including fresh immigrants. In the total mobilization, the declaration pulled its weight. Not surprising then that many years later when Ben-Gurion was asked whether he now would change anything in the declaration, if he could, he answered bluntly, I wouldn't add or change anything. On the day he proclaimed it, remember, he'd admitted to the People's Council that the draft declaration wasn't the height of perfection, right? wasn't the height of perfection, but it had performed just fine. So years later, when he looked back on it, he saw perfection itself. Thus did Ben-Gurion's perspective on the Declaration evolve over time. Yet this is the remarkable aspect of the document. Although it doesn't change, our perspective constantly changes. And each generation, over 70 years, has read it differently. In this lecture series, we focused on the genesis of the Declaration and touched on one aspect of its post-1948 life in the realm of the law. But much more could be said. How has it been interpreted by and reinterpreted by intellectuals and thinkers? What role has it played in the political rhetoric of politicians? How has it been deployed in Israel's educational system? How have artists referenced it? How have Israel's enemies understood it? And just as an aside, Mahmoud Dawish, the Palestinian poet who wrote the Palestinian so-called Declaration of Independence, 1988, said he relied on the model of the Israeli Declaration, and you can see it in the Palestinian text. Not only has the Declaration lived many lives in the past, 
there are plans for its future. Until now, the Declaration has been kept in storage. But it's planned that it will go on regular public display in Independence Hall, just as the American Declaration is on display at the National Archives. When it does, it will go from an iconic image in facsimile to an object which Israelis, to which Israelis will make pilgrimage. How will access to the original artifact affect the public perception of the Declaration's content? The future of the Declaration may prove as significant as its past. I began by calling the Declaration of Independence the most consequential document composed by Jews since antiquity. It wasn't a miracle. It was the work of people with strong preferences, even prejudices. But it also expressed the collective wisdom of the most determined and driven Jews in modern history, in the finest and most faithful hour of the Jewish people. In 1948, the Supreme Court found the Declaration expresses the vision of the people and its faith. Given all that we know and have discussed about the drafting and the debates around it, it's truly amazing that it should do just this, and so enduringly. After all, we've heard the criticisms of its style and of its substance by the people who helped to draft it. Yet it captured the spirit of a people arisen, the troubled but proud history of the Jews, the national aspirations of the Zionist movement and the Yeshuv, and the grit of the people of Israel all shine through. Seventy years into Israel's independence, its drafters and signatories are gone. Their signatures have begun to fade. Some of the names are forgotten. But the document lives in Israel's law, politics and culture, and in debates over Israel's future. I'll end with a modest suggestion. I said at the start of the series that I hadn't made a close reading of the Declaration until this past year. Like millions of Israelis and Jews, I celebrate Independence Day, I attend receptions, watch the Air Force flyovers, visit open military bases, but I'm now persuaded that no Independence Day is complete without a reading of the Declaration of Independence, just as no Passover is complete without reading the Haggadah. Not, uh, not to listen to Ben-Gurion read it, he had his purpose, but to read it ourselves for our purpose, which is to see Israel flourish and prosper in the community of nations. This will become ever more difficult if we fail to see that declaring and winning independence are not one-time acts. They are repeated actions. That's why the declaration drafted in a rush against a deadline by preoccupied leaders in the midst of a war remains timeless. The Mishnah says, in every generation, one is obligated to see himself as though he too came out from Egypt. And in every generation, one is obligated to declare the independence of Israel. Thank you for your patience and attention. This concludes the lecture series. <laughs>